Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage of Cloudera Evolve 24. We are live in New York City. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Bob Liberté. Bob, let's talk about the, the buzzword of the year, if not the millennia, AI. What is this AI you speak to? <laughs> I think I've heard of it, yes. Okay, a good segue, a good segue to welcome our next guest. Priyank Patel, he is the GM Enterprise AI at Cloudera. Welcome, Priyank. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Rebecca. So you have a big job. Let's let's face it. Tell our viewers a little bit about how about what your focus is yeah. as as the GM of Enterprise yeah. AI. So I I work uh, with our product teams, engineering as well as products, to deliver our services that our customers are going to use and deploy and build their own applications with AI. So that AI does not just remain a buzzword, but it actually delivers value. And my focus in this role is always being customer first and to make sure that they are spending the money that they are, they're spending the time that they are with us and with the technology to get the eventual business value that they do. And we're seeing amazing results of that uh, all throughout. Awesome, that, that sounds great. And I think one of the reasons why we wanted to talk to you today is that you might have had an announcement with one of those other companies that, that plays in AI a little bit. What's right? NVIDIA, I believe they're called. <laughs> um, and, and so I'm wondering if you can talk, right? So clearly everyone knows NVIDIA. Everyone's seen obviously, their technology. Obviously. Everyone's been talking about their partnerships with them. You've got an announcement today. Can you elaborate a little bit on what it is you're yes. announcing? Yes, okay. yes. So when you think of NVIDIA and when most, most of your viewers and everybody here thinks of NVIDIA, we think of them as a hardware company, the company that makes GPU and the hardware that is the core to AI, right? The announcement we made today is actually nothing to do with the hardware. Right. What we are integrating is the software stack that the NVIDIA, that the NVIDIA team has built out, something called NIM, NIM Microservices, and that's essentially a full stack, it's an integrated hardware software uh, layer that sits above their GPUs. Yep. About a year ago when we started working with this tech, I, I remember clearly going to my teams and asking, uh, you know, we have these NVIDIA GPUs and with a, with a lot of effort we had gotten our hands on it, though that's a, that's a separate discussion we can have. Uh, and I was like, we need to be able to run these models that we want to experiment on, and we were at that time experimenting a lot more. We want to be able to run these in the most efficient manner because there's a, there's a finite resource and it's a scarce resource and it's an expensive resource. Let's make sure we are the best performance. They tried for a significant amount of time to optimize. We got better, but then we realized that if you are going to try to optimize on somebody's hardware, you are better off learning from what they are doing with their software as well, which is where NIM came in and NIM got, NIM got us started and attracted to it. We learned more of what goes into the NIM and that really formed the basis of a service that we went general with, uh, GA with today. That's the Cloudera AI inference service. Right. It's the model serving offering from Cloudera yep. that works anywhere on public clouds as well as uh, on-premise and fundamentally enables our customers and enterprises to have private endpoints for AI, to be able to build and run AI privately. That's the, that's the announcement. Excellent, and I think what's really compelling to me is that it started as an internal service. You were using it yourselves right. before bringing it out to your customers because then it's not just yeah, well this, this isn't something we just put together 100%. and we're going to meet in the field to sell. 100%. This is something you've already worked with, you've tightly integrated it with your solution yep. and you're able to now bring it out and have your customers gain benefit. Absolutely, from. absolutely. Drinking your own champagne. 100%. So what what have you found in it in terms of working with your own teams in terms yeah. of the benefits yeah. and what makes it so special? So we have uh, the, the internal teams that work on it, we have we have two streams in my role that I drive. One is called AI in Cloudera. The other is called AI with Cloudera. AI with Cloudera is about us building the best platform for our customers to build their AI applications with. But AI in Cloudera is about us infusing AI within our platform without our customers ever needing to know about it. And that means there are dozens of teams internally within our organization who are building the co-pilots, the assistants, and the capabilities that would ease the regular day-to-day -day user of the Cloudera platform. And as you know, Cloudera manages a significant amount of data estate, both on-premise and in the cloud. Our last estimate is at about 25 exabytes of data under management. Right. That means that that many number of data users, whether it's data engineers, data analysts, data scientists, 
who are actually interacting with our platform on a day-to-day -day basis. And the teams that are working internally are essentially building these assistants to enable those personas to do the tasks faster. That's what became the first use case for us or the trigger point for us to build an efficient service to even serve out this system. Yeah, I think that's so important because we've heard so many times with the, with the rush to AI and yeah. the board level visibility and the spending on it, but now everyone's looking for what's the ROI. That's right. And so being able to provide your users with ways to more effectively deploy and get results faster yes. is something that we see on and on again. Everyone's looking for, give me those validated designs, give me the pre-engineered yes. designs, give me the tightly integrated solutions so that I can accelerate the, you know, the, the time to value yes. with my AI solution. 100%. Yeah. While we were doing this, obviously the world of AI, it would be an understatement to say that it evolved. It has exploded, right? And our customers have also, when we learn from our customers as well, while we were building this, our customers have come and told us that they are not just building applications of the kind that we are most used to around chats and documents yeah. and Q&A, but they've started building agents, which are again powered by models, and they have started to move towards these smart, think of it like bots, which are taking action on behalf of the end user, right? And so yeah. that, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, that's such a fascinating point that you bring up because, as you said, you're working with customers who are using AI already in their jobs, but, right. but we're also using it as a chat GBT has exploded. Got it in our personal lives and we're using, we're using Gen AI in so many different ways, which perhaps makes us more demanding customers right. as customers of, uh, in our personal lives as well as when we are looking at <laughs> service providers yep. in terms of what, what, we, what we are demanding, what we need, what we right. want to see. Right, yeah. right, absolutely. And I think the, the most uh, visceral uh, reaction I have is when I actually go to Ch chat GPD, I get 90% good answers and the 10% that I get which is not good, which is not relevant or aligned with what I want, it makes me realize that this is after all, as um, as was mentioned uh, earlier by my co-presenter on the stage uh, from NVIDIA, she said, you know, models are after all like new employees. They don't know anything about your company, about your context, about in my, in my case, my life. So I can, they cannot, they, they are not contextualized yet. And that really is the opportunity, obviously, for companies such as us and Cloudera, this is the opportunity that we can sell uh, our customers in the enterprise. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's that ability to leverage your private data yeah. to take those models from 80, 85% efficacy to 95 or 100% yeah. efficacy. Yeah. And you had mentioned also the agent, right? Agentic AI, one of the really buzzwords that are coming out now, talking That's about right. how do you leverage those agents to drive greater efficacy, to drive That's greater right. context. That's right. So. That's right. So security and compliance is a key differentiator of this. Can you talk a little bit about, about what you were hearing from customers in terms of their pain points and, and yes. what problems this solves? Yes. So the fu fundamental pain point is to be able to understand that what data I'm giving to the model for is, or to be able to, um, to say with certainty that the data that I'm feeding the model is not being is not leaving the perimeter of security that I am comfortable with that that has been defined right and that is first of the first and foremost about not leaving the perimeter and that's where oftentimes when customers are rushing fast with POCs experiments they are using third party services and making calls elsewhere for that matter when I'm using OpenAI I am oftentimes uploading you know, documents that I shouldn't be always uploading from my laptop onto the chatbot over there, assuming that it won't be used otherwise. But that's not a liberty that you can take in the enterprise setting. And that's the first and foremost security and governance part. The, from there onward, the questions that we are hearing are more around how do we govern which parts of the data? Because it is also not the case that once it is inside the perimeter of security that you can have all the data go over there. There is PII data, there is HIPAA compliance data, there's compliance around data that has matured over multiple decades. Right. And as to ascertain what part of this is fair game for the model versus not is, I want to say it's a, it's an open question and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real concern and everybody is evolving trying to figure this one out. So this is the, this kind of, the, and this, this becomes a very strong point of discussion with our customers. Um, and you know, it's always a, it's a balance. Are you going for, are, are you worried about it so much that you never move a finger? Or are you willing to let, let a few experiments happen and then find the middle ground? And, and customers tend to struggle around it. And you know, that's, yeah. that's, that's the balance. 
No, that's, that's a great point. There's always been that struggle between security and performance or security and agility and so forth. Security agility, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, the, the, the best way to be secure is to not do anything. Correct. <laughs> Naturally, you are guaranteed to be secure. There's nothing. Absolutely. So one of the questions I wanted to bring up to you is, how do you see some of the developers starting to work with AI? You talked about NIMS, software, et cetera. Right. right? How is that impacting the developer? Space? Amazing. Uh, so, we used to think, I mean, we've been, we've been uh, building machine learning and data science platforms at Cloudera for over 10 years now, right? Uh, when we started out two years ago, the core competence of actually building these AI systems was with the data science teams, the AI teams, the machine learning teams, because that's the technology evolution of these deep learning networks. As it has progressed to now, we see and we, we coin, we internally use the term Gen AI builders, okay. intentionally not calling them developers, intentionally not calling them scientists, because we think that there is a simplification of the skill set and upleveling of skill set that has gone through in the industry. There are a lot more. Consequently, there are a lot more. There's a lot more access to such talent that customers and our our uh, clients have, and that is the kind of uh, that that is the kind of persona, if you may, that we are building our products to. What they are faced with is a explosion, a massive explosion of hundreds of frameworks combined with thousands of models combined with yet another hundreds of places to run it and trying to find the combinatorial fix or mix over here, which is going to be the best for that use case. Right. So it is a daunting task if you are out there and trying to make sense of it. You are essentially trying to catch a moving train every morning you wake up. It's true. I'm so sorry. One of the things that we heard on the on the main stage this morning was this idea of accidental architecture yes. and how and how data platforms are really evolving. I'm curious to hear your take on what you're seeing and what you're hearing from customers in terms of how they're grappling with these challenges as these platforms yes. change. Yes. It's a it's a great phrase because it captures what's really happening. The accidental architecture is not it's not planned. It happens because business priorities have to be met, whether it is through an acquisition that happened in a different country, whether it is just a different team that decided to go on a different path for a couple of years and now you are suddenly stuck with a couple, with, with these architects. I feel like my house is almost a product of an accidental, accidental architecture. architecture. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk about that in, on, a, on a different podcast. Time. <laughs> Let's talk about that. All right, so it's true that the data architecture is also evolving. There's always this push and pull and I've been in this space for a while at the data level you, you either gravitate too much towards being centralized or you gravitate too much towards being decentralized. Meaning, you are always in like multiple disparate systems or you have this vision that everything is in one system. Right. If you work in this space enough, you know that it's neither, neither of the extremes, it's somewhere in the middle, which is there is a gravitation towards going to, gra uh, there's a gravitational pull towards going to a centralized architecture. Yeah. But there's reality and we have had customers tell us like, I will not move the data out of this old system because the migration cost is more than what I can do anything with it. So this, it just does not make economic sense. So now what? So make it work. At this point, this is the steady state, make it work with this. And that's where data meshes and, and, uh, and, uh, and the approaches to actually access data in disparate systems, yet provide a single semantic view, comes up. It gets multiplied exponentially in the world of AI, because think about it, where do the documents, where does the unstructured data that goes into these models sit in an organization. Right. It's in multiple disparate systems. Mm -hmm. And that is, and that is some might say it's not even accidental. That is in, in fact planned that I'm, I'm, I'm hosting my PDFs over here, I'm hosting my documents over there, my, uh, my website uh, assets are over there. All of these need to be given to the model and you have to work in an environment which is, which is multi-system and that's, right. uh, that's needed for the AI systems, for, for AI to be built as well. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. The complexity only continues to increase as the IT environments and application environments become far more distributed. And so having to, that ability to unify all that data without centralizing all that data is hugely important, it's, it's right? It's hugely important, it's definitely important. It, do, it, does, take, uh, it does take intentional uh, effort. It, it doesn't happen without, uh, it, we've seen some customers, one of the customers, uh, Abby, who spoke on our main stage, yep. you know, a lot of the amazing outcomes that they shared with us in the 20 minutes that they spoke is, is built on multiple years of building that underlying knowledge base, yep. and that came with an intentional effort. You know, at that time that they were building it, 
the results of what they shared today with respect to the life-saving uh, advances that they are able to make was not you could not have imagined at that yeah. time you just had to do the centralization of that knowledge and that's what they did yeah and i think that's that's super impressive obviously when you're saving lives as well it's even more important it was interesting we had a guest on earlier who runs a small international airport and it was it was interesting to hear you com compare that massive organization with oh. all sorts of data right to also being able to benefit an organization like his. And he was able to come in very quickly, tie in five or, or more different disparate data sources, unify them all, and drive real value very quickly with one person, essentially. So that's great to hear the, right, yeah. the contrast between the small, right, if you're, if you're out there and you're thinking, hey, we're too small to do this, you're, right. you're not, you're not, right? And if you're that large, maybe it takes a little bit more thinking and a little thought going into it, but the opportunity is there as well. The opportunity well. is there. The results are, I mean, it's mind-boggling. You can't, you can't match what they said, but it's mind-boggling results, yeah. Well, Priyank, thank you so much for coming on. A really, really interesting conversation. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Mo. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight for Bob Liberté. Stay tuned for more of theCUBE's live coverage of Cloudera Evolve 24. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis.